In this lecture, we'll design a pure pursuit controller for our autonomous race cars to track a reference path through the environment. Pure pursuit is an example of a geometric path tracking controller, which relies on our kinematic vehicle model for selecting steering commands. It tracks a reference path using only the geometry of the vehicle kinematics and the reference path. In the case of our race cars, a geometric path controller is a type of lateral controller that ignores dynamic forces on the vehicles and assumes a no-slip condition holds at the wheels. Because of its simple nature, it is very popular and useful in robotics and autonomous driving. So the story so far is that, you know, we are given a map with SLAM and the ability to localize you know, the particles with the particle filter. And now what we want to do is we want to specify a race line, as you can see in this rainbow colors over here, for the vehicle to track and race really fast, right? We want to know how can we go as fast as possible along our desired path. And here you see Billy there, he's actually planned out this entire uh, race, virtual racing line and he's racing as fast as he can. All right, and now this is in driving in the same corridor that you've been running your races. And you can see that we're going much faster than you were with your reactive algorithms. And this is where we want to take you. We want to be able to drive, beat your previous uh, race record and race much faster. So today, the lessons plan is that, you know, we'll cover the overall autonomous vehicle planning and control stack. And uh, we'll then review and go over the pure pursuit uh, tracking algorithm in detail. And then by the end of this lecture, you will be able to do in simulation, as you can see on the, on the left, which is our, our previous version of our simulator, where the vehicle is tracking this, uh, this purple uh, line very reliably uh, with very low error. And then you'll be able to do that on the vehicle, as you can see in one of the previous races that we had. This vehicle is following this virtual line and it's tracking it very well. So the pure pursuit algorithm was originally devised as a method for calculating the arc necessary to get a robot back onto a path. Its first application of this method came with the Terrigator robot which goes all the way back to like 1984 in Carnegie Mellon's Robotics uh, Institute. And this was a six wheeled uh, ro uh, skid steer robot that was used for outdoor vision experimentation in, you know, in these early eighties. Then uh, later in the eighties, as you know, the full AV pipeline started to come together uh, where they had uh, this D-Star mission planner, this Ganesha map server, and then the Stripe local planner. And within this Stripe local planner, the first pure pursuit uh, uses were uh, actually implemented. And then several robots through the 1980s and 1990s used pure pursuit. And then as we can see now in the nav lab, the Stripe module allowed the operators to specify the waypoints. So essentially this D-star planner is identifying where the obstacles are and it's updating this map that is managed by the Ganesha map server. And, uh, and then it is starting to plan out its path and it, it has a situational awareness at this point, right? And so now using, you know, a very, very kind of early generations of laser range finders and ultrasound sensors, uh, is able to identify the, the actual conduit or the path in which it can go and then plan a smooth path. And, and then the operator can actually teleoperate this robot, but since the bandwidth was very low, the operator just specified a set of dots of points, as you can see over here, uh, for the robot to follow. And this took into account, you know, the the actual tilt of the robot uh, and, and the terrain uh, and then the robot basically tracked each point and followed this uh, very reliably. And that's how Pure Pursuit came about uh, in the early robotics world. 
So now let's look at the entire planning and control stack, right? From today's lecture on, we'll focus at the whole autonomous vehicle and look at this complete stack, you know, and where each module is doing its own job. So the common model that's shown in this figure over here, this is this follows the sense, plan, act loop. In the sensor module, um, the measurement signals can either be unprocessed as in the LIDAR and odometry signals or process as we'll see next, right? The perception module will run the map server, localizes the vehicle, the planner, then uses these sensor measurements to determine its state and explore the next states. The actuator generates a sequence of steering and acceleration inputs to move the vehicle to this next state. This repeats anywhere between you know, 20 to 50 times a second. Now, the perception stack you know, inputs you know, raw and processed sensor data as shown over here, this includes like the RGB camera data uh, captured by one or more cameras, the depth of this, uh, sensor uh, outputs. This could be either with uh, RGB depth cameras, stereo cameras, uh, LIDARs. And then calculus also, we can also input the optical flow, say using FlowNet. And really this is looking at how fast obstacles are, uh, are, are objects are moving in our vicinity. And then you have traditional object detection and then semantic segmentation to determine the drivable surface. These are all input now into the sensing and perception module. And then we basically go to the planner, right? And there are multiple levels of this planner and essentially this planner has to decide, well, what do we do next? What is the path that we need to track? And then it has to generate these outputs uh, for, for the actuator and that's essentially the steering and acceleration inputs into the vehicle uh, that gets the vehicle to its next state right so if we just zoom in now on the pl planning module alone well at the top level we have the mission planner right so this is kind of like google maps is really saying you know what's the overall goal of this vehicle if it's if it's outdoors say i want to go from philadelphia to new york i have to take a certain interstate highway say i-95 uh, and that's the main path that I'm taking. Uh, then the behavioral planner says, well, what rules should this vehicle follow in different situations? If I'm going on this long journey from Philadelphia to New York, then I have to get on to this on-ramp to get onto the highway. And therefore I need to basically switch to my, my left lane or my right lane and get onto this on-ramp. Uh, or if I'm in, in, in the front, uh, I, I see there's a pedestrian walking what should I do? Should I slow down? Should I avoid? Uh, should I hit the brakes uh, immediately, right? And so essentially this behavioral planner, you can think of it as making all these discrete choices of slowing down, changing lanes uh, and, and adapting to the local situation. And then we have the local planner. The local planner is saying, well, you want me to get onto this on-ramp, uh, then uh, I, I can gen it generates a set of trajectories and then it figures out you know, what's the optimal trajectory from its current position to get to the goal. And that's where we're gonna focus on today is in the local planner's uh, view, right? So essentially, as you can see in this local planner for this vehicle running in this uh, simulated environment, it's generating a set of splines, right? Uh, smooth curves that look ahead maybe about 100 meters or it could be even be 100 milliseconds uh, and then you can see in the center is a is a is a turquoise or a, or a light blue uh, line, and that's sort of the, the the trajectory that it's selecting. That's the optimal trajectory it's selecting to follow this path along this road. And now you know this was actually a real test that we had done uh, quite a few years back um, when uh, we worked in Nagoya in Japan, and then our partners actually rented this this road this lane for for the day. And then we could actually drive along that path for real. And this is the car that is actually driving along this dedicated lane to test out the vehicle doing object detection, signal light detection. And it's sticking at a fixed you know, uh, velocity of 40 miles per hour and generating these splines and figuring out what is the local path that it should, it should uh, proceed with. And so, now going forward, you know, we want to see in this uh, planning and uh, going from local planning 
we, we want to basically essentially track a given trajectory, right? That's the trajectory that we've selected. So how do we track this given trajectory? How do we correct for actuation errors? Because we're never going to perfectly be able to track a trajectory. And then most important of all is how do we drive as fast as possible, right? So that's the focus of today's lecture. So in the pure pursuit method, the core idea is that a reference point can be placed you know, on a path, a fixed distance ahead of the vehicle. And then the steering commands needed to intersect with this point using a constant steering angle can be computed. As the vehicle turns you know, towards the path to follow this curve, the point continues to then move forward to the next point, and then essentially reducing the steering angle over time and then gently bringing the vehicle towards its path. Right? So essentially we are giving a set of waypoints and now following them one by one uh, as, we, as we go towards our overall destination, right? So, so before we start, we're gonna make a few assumptions. The first one is that the vehicle is given a sequence of 2D points or as we call them waypoints in the map that we want to follow. The second one is that the vehicle knows where the given waypoints are in its own frame of reference. So the underlying assumption is that given a set of waypoints in a global coordinate, uh, frame, you can then localize your vehicle and then transform them to your local, you know, coordinate frame. So this is where the particle filter from last week comes in, right? And lastly, our goal is to then just follow these waypoints one after the other. So given a waypoint, how do we set the steering angle correctly? You know, what path will the vehicle follow um, as it tracks a waypoint, right? So let's start from the vehicle's local frame. As we mentioned in lecture three in the rigid bodies and pose representations, the local frame's origin is at the center of the vehicle's rear uh, ax axle on the car, right? Then the x-axis is the forward direction of the vehicle and the y-axis points to the left of the vehicle. So we use a right-hand coordinate system. So it's always going to be like this for our car. Then next we introduce a concept of the look ahead distance, right? So this is uh, as simple as you're looking ahead for a fixed distance and you're searching for a waypoint in your list of waypoints to track. We define the line that connects the center you know, of the rear axle to this target reference point uh, or the, the goal point as a line of fixed distance L. So this is known as a look ahead distance, which is the black dashed line over here Oh, and this is a single parameter of the pure pursuit algorithm, right? So this is basically we are looking at a waypoint, you know, in that radius of L, for example. So let's say we figure out some way to select this goal point, and we're going to denote it by the coordinates, you know, X and Y. Since our robot is non-holonomic, we can't just turn in that direction and go straight to that waypoint, right? So we have to follow this arc, you know, because we have a Ackerman steering, right? So let's you know, then draw this arc over here so, and so that we can then follow this arc to get to the goal point, right? So the problem is you know, what curvature should this arc be, right? Should it be like this, this orange arc uh, that we have here? And, um, or uh, it could be um, like uh, this blue arc that we have here, right? So there are many possible arcs between these two points so the real issue that we need to think about now is how do we make this arc unique? So we want to control essentially the front wheel angle uh, such that the vehicle follows this given path, right? So this is known as a lateral vehicle control. The angle is chosen such that the vehicle will reach this target point according to the kinematic bicycle model. So let's draw the bicycle model and you know, the given path that we should follow here. And we also draw the, circus, the circle of you know, radius LD around the center of the rear wheel um, to signify the look ahead distance, right? So the intersection of this circle with the path uh, is our goal point or our target point TP. According to the kinematic bicycle model, the vehicle will move along the orange arc which is determined by the front wheel angle delta. So we want to choose delta such that the orange vehicle trajectory will move to the target point. So the ICR that's written over here is the instantaneous center of rotation. 
is the point fixed to the body undergoing this planar movement you know that has zero velocity at the particular instance of time so at this instance the velocity vectors you know of other points in the body generate a circular field along this icr point which is identical to what is generated by just a pure rotation right that means this point is not moving around it's just rotating about its position so at 25 degrees we have no luck in getting to our target point so we can pick a smaller angle say 20 degrees and and uh, still we are not intersecting with tp and then a smaller angle say 15 degrees at this target point is still out of reach and then we finally you know find a real angle that intersects with this target point and that's in this case 11.3 degrees it's just some um, the arbitrary number in this example so rather than trying you know this bunch of guesses you know uh, 20 25 25 20 15 um here what we actually see is that the distance from the icr to the tp is equal to r that's this radius of this this curve uh, of of the circle that we are looking at so this is because the tp lies along this you know ordered circle of radius r around the icr right so that gives us a clue as to what constraint we need to get a unique arc so let's go back to our race car view uh, you know what do we do now is that we constrain the center of this arc over here to be uh, on the y axis of the vehicle right so at this blue where this blue circle is uh, so the arc here is going to be then tangent you know to our x axis and that will be the constraint for our arc so we'll have the radius you know of the arc r over here and then along the y axis the absolute value of y you know to our goal point and then the forward distance is the absolute value x to our goal point uh, so we only know x and y at this point and we need to solve for the steering angle for this one frame so let's start solving you know some of these values right so the two known relationships that we are given is this arc constraint right so the radius of this arc r is equal to the absolute value of y um, plus this value d right we don't know what d is at this point we also know that you know d squared plus x squared is equal to this radius squared right in that triangle on the right side next we'll substitute out d you know as r minus the absolute value y uh, <clears throat> and then the expanded square term you know gives us this right so so then we substitute you know x squared plus y squared with this look up, uh, this look ahead l squared right so then in the next step we can get rid of you know the radius you know r squared right it cancels out on both sides in this uh, equation here and then we get to the final relationship you know uh, for r in terms of l and the y coordinate right so we don't have d here we just know our look ahead distance we know our y and uh, so we know the radius is now equal to this so how does this help us since we know the radius can determine you know what the curvature of the arc is right so essentially the curvature is 1 over your radius and that's going to be you know two times this absolute value y divided by the look ahead distance squared so we have this nonlinear relationship between the curvature and this look ahead distance so when l is small uh, you can see that the steering angle should be bigger so you have a you know a larger arc uh, and so when the wheel angle is going to be proportional to this curvature of this arc right so to determine the steering angle you solve for the arc uh, gamma which is the curvature of this arc that we are actually chasing uh, then you put then what you can do is you can put a pid control or a p control that is proportional to this curvature right and uh, so in the past we looked at you know p control for our reactive algorithms here we are using uh, our pid pid control there and so similarly here we are going to use uh, you know this uh, p p control that is proportional to this curvature you know as we mentioned before the look ahead distance is a single parameter we choose for pure pursuit and that determines the steering angle for this single frame
So once we reach the goal point in the current time, how do we update the goal point you know, from this list of waypoints, right? In other words, we need to find a relationship between the goal point that you want to follow and the change needed in the current steering angle to get there. And then we need to get to the next goal point and, and so on, right? So, so given a, you know, a list of waypoints you know, and our car that is you know, at the bottom, in an ideal world, you know, what you would do is you know, pick the waypoint that's exactly one look ahead distance you know, from, from where we are, right? So you want to just find one that is exactly the closest one um, to you that's right on our circle. The problem is that you won't always have a perfectly placed waypoint to go to next, right? So, so we need to figure out you know, different methods to select this next waypoint. So what if there were no waypoints you know, exactly on this radius, as we just said, if we pick the closest one within our circle, that may require you know, some unfeasible steering. And we also may not be, you know, in, be in the general direction that we want to go, right? So we can find the closest waypoint you know, that's just beyond the radius and pick that one, right? So that's just outside of our circle. Or uh, what we could do also is, uh, we could interpolate you know, with that waypoint and the waypoint closest to it inside the circle and select the intersection of this line segment and the circle as our goal point. And that's going to be the look ahead distance L. So there are many ways to you know, dynamically also change the distance you know, of this look ahead to that's based on speed. And we'll look at that in more detail later on, right? So, so let's just uh, uh, try to understand, you know, how do we now put these pieces together, right? So basically we have this particle filter that's going to listen to our major scan message, and then it's going to update the guesses with the current pose. So your pure pursuit is then going to be subscribing to this pure, this particle filter topic. And then each time that you have a new pose, you could then find the current waypoint based on this look ahead distance. And then you can calculate the steering angle based on that waypoint that you have selected. Then publish that steering angle and basically drive there based on that. And then once you get a new pose, you then do this over and then over again. So basically every time you get a new pose, you're going to search for a goal waypoint, calculate the steering angle, and then move towards that and repeat. So, uh, <clears throat> So, and that's exactly what we see here. So every time you get a new pole, we find the next waypoint and then you change your steering angle and then you keep doing that. And you can see that we are gradually getting to our overall goal, right? So you, you'll have some curve. Now you can see it's not exactly like fitting the points over here. And so we, there are, you know, as you can imagine there are going to be errors along the way. And we want to understand, you know, what are the sources of these errors and how do we deal with them? So, so tuning the pure pursuit is really important. So there's only one parameter as we discussed before the, the lookup distance. So basically the smaller the look ahead that we have to lead to more aggressive maneuvers. And as we have a higher curvature, it means that your steering angle will be higher for a given waypoint. So you'll see a lot more swerving, right? And the swerving is caused by the steering delay in the servo. As you can imagine, if you give it a steering, you know, the steering uh, command doesn't immediately go to that right angle, right? So your car is going to travel further up and then slowly turn, you know, to the to that radius uh, by the point that you're going to then overshoot and then you're going to correct yourself again by then setting it to another on the other side. And then you're basically going to have this oscillation along this waypoint, right, that we see over here. So that's basically this proportional control that is proportional to this curvature. So if you have a smaller look ahead, you're going to have a you know, high curvature for the arc and then the P gain goes up, right? So around the center line, you're going to have a lot of oscillations. Uh, so then the larger, the L, you're going to have you know, a smoother trajectory, but you're going to have a higher tracking error. So we have this kind of trade-off as to how do we pick you know, this look ahead distance. So tuning this look ahead distance L you know, and then adding a gain to our curvature will change the behavior of, you know, our pure pursuit. So for example, in this Levine hall that we have, with the, we have this rectangular loop, for example, where you have 90 degree turns and you want to be careful not to have too big a look ahead distance. So imagine you're, you're going around the corner to your next goal 
And, and just before you hit the corner, your next goal point is beyond the corner, right? And, and you're not even at the turn, but the next goal point is around that corner. So you're going to start turning before the turn comes in, and then you're going to hit the inner wall uh, too soon, right? Because your uh, look ahead distance was too large. So, uh, so one other sort of thing that you should do is, so uh, you could put a velocity component at each waypoint and then hand tune that, right? So in the previous race, some of the teams did this with their reactive methods. So if you have a, essentially you have a higher, you know, if you have a higher steering angle, you're going to go at a lower speed. And then you can kind of do the same thing here where you just put a lower velocity around the corners and then higher velocity on the straights. So the look ahead distance is typically then chosen to depend on the speed, you know, using a constant P gain of the velocity where this constant then also needs to be tuned. So you can then enforce, you know, a minimal and a maximal look ahead distance so as to avoid undesirable behavior at very high speeds or very low speeds. Oh. As we said before, the pure pursuit also doesn't consider the dynamics of the car. Right? So we are assuming that our car is going to be able to follow the arc, but it might you know, produce some dynamically infeasible curves. So keep that in mind. If you have you know, too small a look ahead, it might just go crazy and crash into the wall. Um, so we see that this you know, simple approach has a downside that its performance suffers when the vehicle motion does not match this no slip assumption, right? As in the case of very aggressive vehicle maneuvers with high lateral acceleration. In these cases, a deeper understanding of the limits of the available tire forces is needed, you know, as are more involved, you know, uh, control strategies. In the when the vehicle is operating in the linear uh, tire region and the tire is not saturated, however, geometric part tracking controllers can work very well. And that's why we're going to be operating at least for this next race. So now let's wrap it up and put it all together and uh, look at you know, how we actually get this to work. Uh, so the first thing you need to do is create a map using your uh, you know, graph slam package. And then you need to create a list of waypoints using a global planner. So initially you don't have anything. So the easiest way is to first drive around you know, the track with Teleop, and then you can record the poses you know, that the particle filter gives you as a list of waypoints. Then you'll want to create a spline with all the points that goes around the track. And you could possibly look into the SciPy interpolate splint, you know, as one option. And uh, so after you record the waypoints, you might find, you know, you have to find a way to smooth it out along the path and also try to have equally spaced waypoints. Then you're going to spin up your particle filter node and you're going to localize on the map. And once you are able to localize, you subscribe to the post topic. And then you do this updating scheme that we've discussed, right? So you pick a new uh, current waypoint every time, and then you get a new pose, sending out a steering angle update uh, to the pose, and then you repeat as we go forward. So now you're going to actually be able to run your car a lot faster and have a lot better control than the reactive methods. And you will also get a pretty good workout chasing the car. And this is an example of the race that we had in Colombia. Uh, a few years back and here you can see the car is essentially speeding up you know along the straights and then slowing down along the curves and uh, yeah you could be more aggressive uh, so that wraps up this lecture on pure pursuit you know as always this course is a team effort with contributions from a variety of individuals and we are grateful from learning from each other uh, and now we can go into the lab component